The next speaker is, is Dr. Matthew Gibson, Assistant Professor of Economics at Williams College, with expertise in economics and labor economics, or environmental economics and labor economics. Um, fascinating in reading his paper, because I lived it, when Hurricane Sandy hit this region, or not exactly New England, immediately to the west, all of us at, at EPA were drawn into the, into the big disaster that that represented. So his paper speaks to that. What, what does it mean to have these things happen and how do markets react? Uh, namely, flood insurance reform or the attempt at it. I can let the senator speak to that. Um, Hurricane Sandy, which is a, a really tremendous event that, that changed so much down in that region. And of course, the infamous FEMA floodplain maps, which I can tell you in this region were largely, or the revision of them was largely a, a disastrous event for all of us because it, it created all kinds of community uh, angst and concern as, as we went forward. So now I'd like to turn the program over to, to Matthew. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this work with you today. First thing, first project on the docket here has to do, as Lynn said, with residential property market in New York City. In particular, we'll be looking at single family homes, and this is work with Jamie Mullins at UMass Amherst and a former student of mine, Allison Hill. We're interested when you shock a residential property market like New York's consequential coastal market with more than $60 billion in its 1% annual risk floodplain, what, how do market participants respond? And in particular, we'll be talking about these three risk signals. The first is, and I, I do hope that the co-sponsors of this bill were chosen strategically, the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012. What did, what did this do? In, in brief, it set subsidized NFIP premiums, National Flood Insurance Program premiums, to increase at an annual rate of up to 25% per year until reaching actuarially fair levels, meaning levels at which people's payments, their premiums, reflect the flood risk to property that's being done. It also was supposed to do away with grandfathering of risk rating. So under the old regime in the end step, if FEMA redrew the map for your community and said, well, we thought the annual risk to your property was 0.5%, it turns out it's 2%, you got to keep your old premium. Bigger Waters attempted to do away with that. A little bit later in the same year, we get Hurricane Sandy hitting the New York area. It's not, of course, a hurricane by the time it makes landfall, but this was a large, slow-moving storm piled up a great big wall of water in front of it, in front of it and it generated a catastrophic storm surge. Finally, the risk signal in which we're perhaps most interested, which might have the greatest policy relevance, is the release of the redrawn FEMA floodplain maps, ABFE's advisory based flood elevation. And these are still, still the subject of litigation and controversy. But the first release of those updated maps was in 2013, received a lot of press, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, etc. If you look at Google search activity, you can see it spiking quite a bit just in this month. Why are these maps important? At the time Sandy came ashore, the maps, in effect, had last been meaningfully redrawn in 1983. Terribly outdated. Between 1983 and the release of the new maps in 2013, the New York area experienced about three and a half inches of sea level rise. New York is getting hit worse than average because the plate on which it sits is pivoting downward at the same time the ocean is rising. And as a result, the redrawn floodplain is substantially larger in scope than it was previously. This is the southern part of Brooklyn, Coney Island. And the old floodplain is represented by these areas in orange. The new floodplain includes the orange areas, but also the areas colored in yellow. By the way, each one of the little dots you see on this slide reflects one of the single family home transactions we observe in our data. You can pick out the parks and streets without even plotting them explicitly, which is nice. But a lot of people are plausibly getting some new information in this scenario about the risk of their property. We'd like to know how they react. You can do this analysis with pictures. So if we're interested in the effect of the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act, this rise in premiums, we can divide our sample of properties into those that were outside the 1983 floodplain 
and thus unaffected by bigger waters largely, and those in the 1983 floodplain who were plausibly affected by bigger waters. We see a relatively large peak to trough drop here, but I do want to caution you, many of the same homes that experience premium increases under bigger waters also get hit by sand. So that peak to trough reflects both phenomena. When we put this into a richer statistical model and estimate the effect of bigger waters in isolation, it's about a 2% fall in price for the affected homes. In this picture, we're looking at the effect of Sandy itself, the experience of being flooded. This is, again, plausibly informative. It's unpleasant in addition to being informative. But we've just, just divided the sample here into three groups, properties unflooded by Sandy, properties in the old floodplain, the 1983 floodplain, who then experienced Sandy flooding. Sandy's perhaps less of a surprise for the properties in that group. And finally, in our third group, properties that were flooded but were outside the 1983 floodplain. This is the group for whom the flooding is plausibly more surprising. We see market drops in transaction prices in both of these groups. Now, ex ante, we thought that the surprise group would exhibit a bigger decline. You don't see that here, and that's because the surprise properties got flooded less deeply. The, the depth of the floodwaters was less high. Once you would adjust for the depth, depth of inundation, if we look at two minimally flooded properties, one that was in the 1983 floodplain at the time Sandy hit, and one that was not, we see suggestive evidence that there's more of a price response for the property that was surprised, that was not in the 1983 floodplain at the time Sandy hit. The average effect, by the way, for those who are curious of being hit by Sandy at, at average inundation is about a 6% price decline. So bigger than the response to the flood insurance premium increases, but smaller, as you will see, than the response to the maps. And it's this last group that's telling us something about the response to the updated floodplain maps. Again, the, we've divided the homes into three groups. Properties outside the expanded 2013 floodplain. Properties that are included in that new 2013 floodplain, but had previously been flooded by Sandy. You might imagine the response you would have gotten had you gone to the door of a New Yorker in 2014, somebody whose home was flooded by Sandy, and said, by the way, the new map says your home is at risk of flood. Our last group is our surprise group. These are our folks who are located outside the boundary of the new floodplain, but escaped flooding in Sandy. And for these people, the map's plausibly more informative. Interestingly, by the way, in this, this final group, you might notice an upward wiggle in the graph just here. That corresponds with the passage of HIFIA, the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act which partially walked back some of the bigger waters reforms. Importantly, though, for our purposes, for new purchasers of homes in a floodplain, and there's really no advantage from it. It slowed the rate of premium increases that was laid out under bigger waters. It restored grandfathering for incumbent owners, but for a person newly purchasing a property in a floodplain, if he really provides no long-term benefit in terms of premiums, and you see that once if he has actually passed, the first of all, optimism goes away. And we see quite a large price decline in this group. How large? It's about an 18% price decline for properties that escaped Sandy flooding and were then included in the 1% floodplain under the redrawn 2013 maps. You may notice, by the way, that I keep saying 1% floodplain. There's been a tendency in journalism and sometimes from FEMA officials to refer to a 100-year floodplain and that tends to lead people into a species of the gambler's fallacy. You know, they say, I've been flooded once, I'm safe for 99 years. It's, it's correct, as most of you in this room know, to think instead, you have a 1% chance of getting hit every year, and that chance is independent from year to year. Now, we didn't want to stop with simply looking at the effect on transaction prices. From a certain point of view, saying that a property is more risky and the price goes down should be unsurprising. We'd like to infer, if we can, something about how people's beliefs are changing. Because efficient decision making by people on the supply side of the housing market or the demand side depends on having accurate beliefs. So we, we impose some assumptions about how people are making decisions. I'm not going to belabor those here. This is our attempt to see what exactly is going on under the hood. 
and we're taking advantage here of an interesting feature of the National Flood Insurance Program. This is estimating the effect of the new maps in bins of structure value. Why is this informative? The National Flood Insurance Program caps structure coverage at $250,000. That's not indexed to location, it's not indexed over time, this is a hard cap that's going to remain in place unless Congress changes it. Why is that advantageous for us? These are the non-surprise properties that get hit by the new maps. And you can see most of these estimates are clustered very close to zero, no matter which bin of structure value you look at. If we look over here, these are estimates for the surprise properties. Properties that escaped flooding in Sandy, but were then included in the 2013 floodplain maps. For cheap structures, the effect is indistinguishable from zero. This is consistent with the risk being fully insurable for these properties. If my structure is worth 200,000, I can buy end of coverage that diversifies away all of the risk. Diversifies the property there, covers all of the risk. For properties with structure value above that cap though, the map is telling me that there's risk is higher than I thought and I can't insure it away under the National Flood Insurance Program. And it's precisely for these properties that we see the largest responses. These are the homes that are driving our 18% average decline in price for this group of properties. If we impose some structure on how people are updating their beliefs, we can back out what the implied change in the agent's, subject, agent, sorry, jargony, home buyer's subjective belief over flood risk is. For the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act, we get pretty close to a zero. That says that people, or I should say that is consistent with people viewing a, a higher flood insurance premium as, a, as an irritation, as perhaps a reason to curse the federal government. There's no evidence that they're changing their belief about the riskiness of their property in response to this insurance price signal. If we do the same thing for Hurricane Sandy, we see about a 0.2 percentage point increase in, the, in people's implied beliefs. Is that small or large? Well, if this is a 1% annual floodplain, in proportional terms, that's a 20% increase in perceived risk. So when people get hit with a Hurricane Harvey, a Hurricane Sandy, when it comes home, then potentially we're seeing some big belief updating, but this is not so policy relevant, right? It, it's not a good idea for us to engineer climate catastrophes so people will update their beliefs. <laughs> if we do this for updated floodplain maps, we see our largest implied belief updating of all. 0.43 percentage points, nearly half a percent increase in subjective belief. I can't tell you whether people are moving closer to or farther away from the truth. It is possible there is some overreaction here. But it suggests that at least in New York, where or Yale, the Yale climate polls will show you that most people believe climate change is anthropogenic and happening, that there's room for a pure information policy intervention to move people's beliefs and therefore move market outcomes. I'm going to say something really quick about city survival. In a certain sense, talking about the response of home prices can feel like middle Nero fiddling while Rome burns. Broadly speaking, climate leads us to ask the question of how long our cities are going to be here, especially for coastal cities, but not only for coastal cities. And based on Laplace, Laplace was the, the old gentleman you saw just here, provided some way of forming a coherent belief about the existential risk to our cities. In particular, this, re this result due to Laplace is if I want the probability of city survival, I can take the number of past years it has survived, plug it into this very simple formula, add one in the numerator, add two in the denominator, and that's my coherent probability of the city surviving next year. What's this say, essentially? Cities that have been around a long time have revealed themselves to be in relatively safe locations. Cities that are young are plausibly less safe and less good bets. American cities are mostly young. I'm going to skip where this formula comes from, but given your belief about risk, you can project survival probability at any given point in the future, and we've done this here for four U.S. cities. Now, Providence is a relatively old U.S. city. It has about a 75% chance of surviving another 200 years. It has about a 25% chance of surviving another 1,000 years. 
But many American cities are much younger. If we look instead at Tampa, it has a 25% chance of surviving another 500 or so years. We can also do this exercise within cities, and it's perhaps here where the connection to climate risk is most important. Census tracts or plots of lands within cities aren't the same age and don't have the same population history. I'm showing you here at San Francisco in 1930 and in 2010. You'll notice the marina and parts of the Embarcadero did not exist even in 1930. A lot of this is landfill. We don't have a lot of experience with people taking the risk of living in these locations. And that suggests that our coherent belief over the annihilation risk or the existential risk in those sites is in relative terms much higher than it is for some place where people have been living for a long time. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much for your time.